Good morning, congregation. So excited to see you today. Uh, so glad that you're inviting us back into your home. We've got some worship to bring you into the presence of the Lord. Remember, he lives within the praises of his people. So as we worship today, I just want you to grasp the fact that you will be bringing the tangible presence of God into your house. And today's extra special because we have communion. Hopefully you've got your bread and your drink ready so that today, together, we're going to take this sanctuary and put it into your house and your home is now your sanctuary for as long as we're quarantined. Uh, what a special moment. It's the first Sunday in May. I'm excited about the seasons starting to move in the direction that they are. And uh, it's just kind of a, a, a wonderful opportunity for you and me to, to take the ongoing afterglow of Easter and, and keep it in motion. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this moment, for, for us to be together. I, I love the way that the church can't be shut down because we might be stuck at home, but wherever we are, you're with us. You say you will never leave us or forsake us. And, and so how exciting to know that we get to enjoy you and that our home becomes a sacred place because you are there. And so, Father, today I, I seek a blessing on everyone watching, everyone participating in this service, that the word of God would penetrate our hearts in a way that not only gives us knowledge, but transforms us, that brings you alive, that sets you up as our God, our Savior, our Lord, and that we respond to Jesus' invitation to move from disciples into friendship with you. Let us get to that intimate spot where we share with you like we would a best friend. And yet you are God. And when we pray and share, you have the power to move mountains, to transform our hearts, to, to fix whatever problem we're dealing with, to bring faith to take the place of fears and wherever we're struggling with doubt to have certainty that you love us, you're for us and you have a future and a hope for our lives. And so as we come into this moment right now, Lord, again, let the supernatural presence of Jesus' spirit start to circulate within each one of us around our households, come out from each one so that everybody who crosses our path will bump into you. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for the love that you have covered us with. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Church family, you know, we love being able to come to you during this time when we are not able to be together in the same space. But before we got into our worship today, what we wanted to say to you is take this time and, and set your space. It, maybe it's in your living room. Invite your family in together and set your heart before the Lord in a way that says, I am ready to receive you, Father. Because you see, we were designed to worship him. We were designed to say, Father, I love you. But the truth of the matter is, first he said, he loves us. And as we position ourselves and ourselves and our homes at this time, and, and we, we listen to Father and say, what is it that you want to say? Some of the songs we might be worshiping with today, maybe you've never sung, and that's okay. What we're going to do is invite you to a space where you can allow this worship to be sung over you. That maybe it is right now you're needing to hear from your Heavenly Father. That you're needing to feel like you're not alone. 
And that's what this is. Worship is more than a designated time and space. It's actually a life before him lived out face to face every single day saying, I choose you because guess what? He chose us first. The invitation is just to open, open your hearts, open your minds because he's within you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So as this worship floods into your home right now, we invite you to worship with us. There are no rules. You don't have to be the best singer. You don't even have to play an instrument. Just make a joyous, holy noise before the Lord. Let him know. Give out a holy shout that you say, God, I exalt you above all other gods because you alone are my king, Jesus. What you've done for me and my family, it's priceless. And guess what? Everything he's done, it's for you. So let it be in this time of worship, Father God, that we are just fully surrendered to you. As we come into the homes of the family right now, that we are one, even though not together in physical space and time, but beyond time, we are united even now in heavenly places with you, Father. So God, have your way. Move in us in a fresh, new way. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being loosed. God, we believe. Yes, we can see it. Wonders are still what you do. Bodies are still. we can see it wanders us to what you do we are
Holy Spirit, we welcome you in. Burn like a fire, blow like the wind. Come, Holy Spirit, we welcome you in. Burn like a fire, blow like the wind. Come, Holy Spirit.
You know, before we move into the scriptures, I, I need to tell you about a, a, some of our parishioners. They, they found in some of the hotels down on 192, there are people living in the hotels. The hotels don't have electricity. They don't have water. And so there's a faucet that they've, all the people living without electricity, they found a faucet and they take their buckets and they're going over and filling them up so that they can, you know, wash and drink and take their baths and do everything that they're doing. And some parishioners of ours found out about this. And well, first of all, they started bringing food. And then the next thing you know, they found out about this water problem. And so they're bringing a plumber to fix the situation. And, and every day they, they've, Figure out a new way to bring the blessings of Jesus Christ to these individuals who are in hotels that are disconnected in every way. And somehow the hotel might be disconnected, but our parishioners have found a way to connect Jesus into their lives just by showing them love and caring for their basic needs. And I'm so proud of them, so moved by them. And I guess I'd like all of us to step into that place where we're, we're actually on our prayer list lifting up people that, that we don't know, that are struggling, and asking God to do something about it. The way you're sending in your, your uh, tithes and offerings and gifts so that we can put into motion Different ministries. The Hope Center is on fire right now with taking care of people in different ways. Uh, we've got so many incredible parishioners stepping out in different ways in their personal lives, caring for neighbors, caring for people in hotels, caring for the whole population on 192. It's Christianity in motion. And friends, you're the one who keeps the motion in motion to keep the love of God flowing, to keep the touch of Jesus with his gentle care and applying it to the everyone they can. Ah, I'm so proud to be your pastor. I thank you for the way that you're keeping the ministry rolling. And, you know, please just let, just receive from me the gratitude that our church has, that you're keeping the doors uh, open so that we can go out and bring Jesus to the people around us. Caring for your staff, caring for your church. I'm so proud of you. I'm so honored to be your pastor. And, and so today, I, I bless you as you give. I, I invite you to let's pray harder. Let's look for opportunities. Let's see the hand of God move through us. Amen? Well, our scripture lesson today, it comes from John chapter 20. It's Doubting Thomas. Hear the word of God. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus showed up. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Well, eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord, and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is the word of the Lord. Well, <clears throat> in last week's sermon, uh, we talked about Jesus who found two disillusioned disciples, not one of the 12, but probably, you know, a couple of the, the 20, the 70, excuse me. And um, he explained to them who he was, actually who he is. And who is Jesus? Well, <clears throat> he's the central figure in all of history. 
okay? His, his crucifixion and resurrection, these are the, the essential events of all time, okay? What happened during Holy Week. This is the most incredible experience that, that humanity's ever had access to. Uh, the creation of, of, of the world, you know, th this was an act of God's power and wisdom. But in Holy Week, we got to experience the salvation of God, his love and his mercy. And, and we're three or four weeks away from Easter, and, and the afterglow is starting to fade. Uh, if, if we don't feed the flames of our faith, they do start to dim. And, and I don't want that to happen to you. Because, friends, the fact that Jesus alive releases power into our lives, it changes us from people who struggle and doubt and are hopeless into folks who step forward with confidence because God is alive and he cares about us. We don't have to be dominated by a sinful mindset anymore because he's put his spirit within us. And now, when he breathed into us, we have the presence of God to guide our steps. We have his presence, his protection, his guidance, his calling upon us. But let's be honest, sometimes it's easy to, to let Easter's meaning start to dissipate because life will come tumbling in upon us. Okay, things don't go the way we wanted and we start to doubt. You know, I remember some of the pastors when the coronavirus quarantine was put into place, they said, we're not going to close our, our, our churches down because we believe the, the power of the Lord is going to protect us. And one of those pastors, well, he died from the coronavirus, which caused the New York governor to say, do you see, Christianity is powerless. Hmm, it's a little bit frustrating. Um, did the pastor's bold move of faith cause people to doubt Christianity? I don't know. Here he is standing on the word of God, claiming the protection of God, and that's not what happened. But, but I want to say something to you. You and I, it's not about when Jesus answers our prayers or not. It's kind of like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Even if he doesn't, let it be known that he is our God. And I think this pastor's death, I mean, it's no big deal for him. He translates into, the, into heaven and, and the fulfillment of his lifelong faith. But there is an invitation. Are you willing to step out on the promises of God? Are you willing to lift up his word and put it into practice, willing to take a risk on what God says? Well, the disciples, they're hiding in fear. Uh, they don't believe that Jesus is resurrected from the dead. Mary Magdalene said, I've seen the Lord. They ran to the empty tomb. Uh, the guys from Emmaus showed up, and, and they just believe it's nonsense. You know, I was reading about <clears throat> uh, Murphy's Law, anything that can go wrong will go wrong, and one of them was this. When you go to court, remember, you're putting yourself in the hands of 12 people who were not smart enough to get out of jury duty. Something to think about. And here we have the disciples who've walked with Jesus, seen his miracles, experienced the very words of God, and yet they think, this idea of his resurrection is nonsense. And this leads us to doubting Thomas. I mean, how would you like to be rem remembered by your worst and lowest moment? Doubting Thomas. All because his reaction to the resurrection was, I demand proof that Jesus is alive. And you can't really blame him. No doubt he stood from afar and saw Jesus dying on the cross. And as I've said before, um, you know, when you see somebody dead, the people who are dead usually stay dead. And, and Thomas, his whole life is in a downward spiral. For three years he's been walking with the Lord. And, and then in the Garden of Gethsemane, first he denied, he deserted the Lord. He ran for his life. Okay, and, and then 
the desertion led to a delay in connecting to the disciples, the other disciples that were in the safe house when Jesus appeared and, and said, peace be with you. They tell Thomas, we've seen the Lord, and he makes his assertion, unless I see the holes in his hands and his side, I won't believe. Apparently, he comes from the state of Missouri, the show me state. And, and, and we assume that, that doubt is the opposite of faith, but actually unbelief is the opposite of faith. Doubt, this is a common human experience. Again, let's be honest. Resurrecting from the dead is not a common affair. It doesn't happen. In fact, it only happens when Jesus did it a few times. And now he's the one who does it and he's dead. So it's probably not going to take place. But again, Thomas had reason to believe. First of all, Jesus said he was going to rise from the dead numerous times. I find it fascinating that the, the Pharisees who killed him, all right, they told a Pilate, listen, this deceiver said that he's going to rise in three days, so put some, some uh, soldiers on the tomb. The guys who hated him and killed him actually believed that Jesus could do it, but his disciples who've seen the miraculous, they didn't. And friends, this is what Christianity is about. It's choosing to believe what Jesus has said. Okay? And here's how it works. When Jesus lays out a statement, we decide, you know what? He is God in the flesh. He is our Savior. He's got heaven waiting for us. He says we can experience God now. And we step forward into believing. And it's as we step forward, we now go on a journey, and the Lord shows up. He doesn't usually show up and say, okay, you know, I'm going to give you the, the format. Here's the map, how it's all going to unfold. No, we step forward in faith, and then he shows up on the journey of life, and we get to experience his presence, his guidance, and all the goodness that comes with this relationship. But here's the problem, okay? Things go wrong. Uh, your loved one gets cancer, uh, somebody betrays you, a prayer request isn't answered, and, and all of a sudden you're at the fork in the road to still have faith or start to roll into doubt, okay? And, and, and friends, doubt is that opportunity, that invitation. It's the catalyst to investigate and examine and, and, and figure out, is what God said really true? You know, a lot of people, they just cross their arms and say, well, I guess not. No, no, no. That leads to unbelief. The investigation, the pursuit of the Lord, this is what brings us into to, to faith. You know, the existence of God that's debated today. I, I mean, honestly, I was in an argument, not an argument, but a conversation with somebody earlier this week you know, they don't believe in God. I don't see God. I think it's funny that Plato, who wasn't a Christian, saw God in creation. Um, but, you know, our scientists who know all about creation, uh, they've deduced that, you know, we come from monkeys who came from a lower life form, who came from, you know, a single cell uh, amoeba, and, and that's how life got started. Okay? The problem is the complexity of, of the world argues against such thoughts, and even the complexity of our bodies. You know, the human body with the respiratory system and the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide and the need for blood to circulate, this all has to fit together or we die in five minutes. Okay, there's no time for an evolutionary process to, to happen and develop this. And people like to dismiss the Bible as a, as a bunch of fairy tales, but archaeological research confirms much of what the Bible has to say, there's never been research that disproves what the Bible has to say archaeologically. And we can get into the scientific, you know, confrontations and arguments, but actually doubt is a personal problem. Let's go all the way back to when the, the Israelites are led out of Egypt. All these incredible miracles, this, the, the Red Sea parts. And, and now God says, okay, go into the promised land, 
and I want you to see what I'm about to give you, and the, the, the 12 spies go in, and they see this is definitely a lush land. They bring back this huge cluster of grapes. But you know, those are fortified cities, and, and the, the people are large, and, and we won't be able to, to, to take it. And, and, and they chose doubt rather than faith. Now, let me remind you, the 10 miracles in Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, okay? We got manna falling from the, the, the sky. We got water coming out of rocks. We see the presence of God in so many incredible ways. And because they settled on doubt, they lived the rest of their lives in a wilderness. And I'm bringing this up because a lot of people, they have doubts about Christianity, and instead of investigating, what they do is they settle on, well, I don't think so, and they live the rest of their lives in a spiritual wilderness. And the presence of God is available to them, but they don't investigate. You know, somebody really close to me, I told them, when you do your investigations against God, make sure that you always seek what the Christian answer is. And almost every time, this is what people do. They investigate the arguments against Christianity, and they don't see what the Christian's argument, the rebuttal is. And they fall into doubt, and they live in a spiritual wilderness. Friends, in this world, you got two options, okay? Because God's going to show up and do things, and bad things are going to happen in your life, okay? We live in a sinful, fallen world, and doubt is what stands between them. This is what George Mueller, this incredible man of God, once said. He said, faith does not operate in the realm of possibility. There's no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. And what I'm trying to say is this. The Israelites, it was never going to be about them. It was going to be about God removing those large obstacles in their lives, just like he did in Egypt. And when you and I stay connected to God, you know, he fights our battles. He's the one who has a purpose and a calling for our lives. And so faith is believing in spite of the circumstances, in spite of the, the contrary that's against you, that God is for you. And, and by the way, we were made in our Christian walk to partner with an almighty supernatural God. This is what he has planned. You know, a ship is safest in its harbor, but that's not what ships are made for. They're made to sail in the seas. And, and you know, for Christians, the church, this is our safe harbor. But in this season of quarantine right now, the church has been shut down. The harbor's been closed off, which has forced each one of us out of the safety of the church into the world where we now are dependent upon God's provisions, his guidance, we're, we're looking for him, we're hopefully each one of us is finding a deeper relationship with him because our routine has been messed up and now it takes a little more energy and effort to, to, to ask for answers to our prayers. Or hopefully your prayer life's coming alive. You're diving into the scriptures. You're using the social media to make connections with the people close to you. You're not trying to wait out two or three months to get back to a normal life. You've created a new spiritual routine. And if you haven't, yeah, guess what? You're, we're all shut down for another month. This is an invitation to turn May into one of the best spiritual moments in your personal life. You know, John the Baptist, Jesus says, of all the prophets, he's the greatest. And guess what? He doubted whether Jesus was the Messiah, the chosen one. Now, mind you, he's heard the voice of God. He's seen the Holy Spirit come down as a dove. Okay? But you see, as a preconceived notion that Jesus is supposed to be a military uh, commander who restores Israel. He doesn't realize that Jesus has come with a, an entire humanity agenda to save us from sin. So what does John the Baptist do? He takes his doubt to Jesus. Are you the one? Did you hear that? Whatever you're struggling with, take it to Jesus and then work it through the scriptures. 
Call your friends, your spiritual partners. You know, get a hold of us at the office because this is how doubt gets fixed by pursuing the answer. And it's kind of fun the way Jesus answers uh, John the Baptist. He brings him back to verses about him in Isaiah because you see John the Baptist's calling comes from Isaiah chapter 40 and Jesus, he gives him verses from chapter 38 and, and, and around that area. Like he, t- he takes his own Bible verses to prove, hey, by the way, your calling, yeah, my calling is surrounded by yours. Truth is, about Thomas, he loves Jesus. He's committed his life to Jesus. His heart has been decimated. And all of a sudden, the other disciples are excited. We've seen the Lord. And and wait a minute. You know, he's the one who said when Jesus was going to go heal Lazarus, raise him from the dead, and the Jews are trying to kill him. And and Thomas says, let us go die with him. I mean, he's committed to Jesus. But, but, But he loves Jesus so much that hearing about it, it's not good enough. It's got to be personal. Remember last week when, you know, the challenge was laid before the two disciples from Emmaus. Um, Do you want to acquire information about who Jesus is? Or do you want to insist that his presence remain with you? They insisted in the presence. They weren't satisfied with just information. And because of that, they got to experience Jesus in an incredible way. And, And here's Thomas. Okay. He wants a personal encounter. In 1 Thessalonians 5.21, it says, test all things. And I want you to hear me. Human nature tends to be a little bit lazy. And we'll get some information, and we'll take your information, and I'll put it into my life, and then I'll try to live off of your information. And, and, And here's what you'll notice in Christianity. People who don't investigate for themselves a personal relationship with Jesus, they're more likely to abandon their faith and they're less likely to advance in their relationship with God. Why am I saying all this? Because, friends, it's supposed to be personal. This is what Jesus has in mind for us. And and again, (laughs) Oh, Thomas just loves Jesus, and he's had a traumatic experience. The one he placed all of his hopes in has died. And, and, and as they're going through this traumatic experience, Thomas, what happens to him? He misses the chance to see Jesus. What happens to him? He's now full of regret. He's now full of doubts. Remember, he deserted Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He still has his own personal issues between himself and the Lord. He's the one who said, let's go die for him, and ran like a coward. He's got issues. You know, I've got a friend, and uh, she has the job that when the pol- police come across a, a, a situation where a, a living person is dealing with the tragedy of somebody they love has died in front of them, and, and they're, they're stuck in the car with their dead loved one or whatever the situation might be. Her job is to come and talk to the person that's had this traumatic experience that they're, they're dealing with right at the moment. And, and the reason that the psychologists bring her in is because if this individual is stuck in an awkward situation, their mind will get into a mental loop that can last forever. That can be the moment that destroys their lives. And so she talks to them. She brings them out of their, their despair. And, 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 and I'm not saying brings encouragement, but definitely there's no agenda other than to move this person away from that horrible tragedy. Friends, all the disciples have been traumatized. The Lord was killed. He was supposed to be God. Um, Thomas, maybe that's why he wasn't there with the disciples. Maybe he needed alone time. And, and, and friends, if you don't take time to be alone with the Lord, um, you're missing out on one of the most incredible opportunities. You know, lately I've been coming into the sanctuary in the wee hours of the morning. I'm having such an incredible time. And, and sometimes God, he gets in my face and goes this. You know, I want you to get rid of this. That, I want you to start doing this. Those people, I want you to start reaching out to them. And, and there's a lot of 
amazing interaction that's going on between me and the Lord. A long time with God, okay? There's nothing to replace it. But sometimes a long time can be detrimental. In Hebrews 10, 25, it talks about don't forsake the gathering, but encourage one another. You see, when we're going through the traumas of life, we're supposed to be with the body of Jesus. You know, how many people, they drift away from the church and their faith falls apart because they didn't remain with the folks who keep plugged into Jesus, who have God's downloads, who who can encourage us to get through the difficult times that everybody has to experience. Well, the disciples heard Thomas's words, but you know who else heard them? Jesus. Now, now realize, Jesus was not there the first time, and yet he knows what Thomas said. Remember what I said last week, that you're, <laughs> you're never alone? Jesus is always with you. He's so tuned into you. According to Psalm 139, he's intimately acquainted with all of our ways. He knows the word that comes from our lips before we speak it. That's how closely involved with your life God is. That's how much he loves you. That's how much you mean to him. That's what he's made available to you. He knows what's going on in your head and heart. And, and eight days later, Thomas gets to experience Jesus. And, and, and doesn't it feel like God makes us wait sometimes? Oh, we're hurting and we're struggling. And, and, and you know, I, I need an answer. Why are you allowing this to, to go on? Maybe you've said the wrong thing and you had to sit in it for a few days or relive it. Or you wish you could take words back that, that you've released. When we read the Bible stories, you know, we go from one story to the next story to the next story, but sometimes there could be weeks and months and decades between what happens in chapter 9 and what happens in chapter 10. Uh, this is the case in, in Acts. It's a 10-year period before uh, one of the chapters shows up again. And, and I'd like to suggest this. How we handle the in-between time is important. You know, Abraham was given a, a, a word from God, a promise. You are going to have a son. That son doesn't come from 25 years later. And we like to think, oh, wow, that was 25 years of silence. No, Abraham lives in a relationship with God. Okay? Uh, they, he's daily worshiping, seeking his guidance, uh, praising, enjoying the presence of God while he's waiting. And, and this is so important, how we wait while God's not coming forth yet. You can wait with an attitude, cross your arms, or you can fill the time reading the scriptures, developing your relationship, letting God set up different parts of what's going on in your life so that you're ready for the answer, the promise that he's made to you. A lot of people get offended with God and they put a halt on the relationship. Don't do that. If God hasn't answered this yet, there's plenty of other components in your relationship with him to develop and cultivate. Well, Thomas, <clears throat> he knows one thing. You can't ignore your doubts. Because they're going to come back and haunt you if you do. They're going to come back at a moment when things fall apart and you need God. I like Thomas. What does he do? He stays connected to the disciples. What does he do? He puts a challenge out. I'm not going to believe. You know, Job demanded the presence of the Lord and he got it. Do you want to see that God responds when you have expectancy that he's going to show up, that he's going to answer your prayers? When you have an attitude and throw a temper tantrum, you know what? God doesn't shake his head at you. He's involved, again, intimately acquainted. He cares about your journey. He wants to be part of it. And notice how Jesus handles the doubter. He shows up and he tells him, stop doubting and start believing. Jesus addresses Thomas <laughs> almost immediately. It's really kind of fun to realize that while we're struggling, Jesus is coming and he's answering our questions. 
And I like the way he kind of slaps, you know, Thomas around. Stop unbelieving. Kind of like he did with the, the two disciples from Emmaus. You know, you foolish unbelieving ones, okay? And the truth is, Jesus speaks to us, not in a way that will destroy our self-esteem, but I've noticed in the scriptures, he usually speaks in a way that, that expects us to rise up with faith and believe in him. Some, he's often gentle, but he's not a coddler. You know, Elijah, he goes running the 40 days to the mountain of God, and he says, God, this is happening, and that's happening, and they want to kill me. And, and God doesn't go, oh, you poor thing. He says, listen, this is what I want you to do. I want you to get up, go home, anoint this king, accomplish this task, do something else, because God's going to be with us as we go and do what we're supposed to do. But what had happened in the in-between time when it was just him and God, he hears the gentle blowing, the voice of God. So do you see how it works? We come to God, he's gentle with us, and then he says, okay, let's go do life together. Let's take care of my agenda together right now. Well, Thomas, he sees Jesus, and he doesn't need to put his finger in his hands. He just goes, my Lord and my God. And, and this statement, this is what we've built our Christian theology on. Remember, Jesus is not just a one spiritual option. He's God in the flesh to take care of and solve our problem with sin, something that no behavior modification has been able to accomplish. Sin is inherent within us, and that's why the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Because it's only the Holy Spirit within us that's able to transfer sin out and bring God in. And friends, a lot of times, you know, our faith, it's insufficient. We're unsteady. And, and you can be reading doctrine, and, and it doesn't seem to, to strengthen you. That's because what you need is the presence of Jesus. I have found when I'm studying, you know, looking for answers, uh, you know, that's, that's a journey that sometimes is fruitless. But when I go through Jesus to look for my answers and do my theological studies, when I put Jesus, the love of God, before me, when I put Jesus, the one who releases his spirit upon us, when I put Jesus, who's, who's invited me into a relationship with the Trinity, suddenly I understand all the other doctrines and how to deal with every other component of my journey. You know, for Thomas, he says, my Lord and my God, and he meant it. He went to India. And do you know that his church apparently is still there? 2,000 years later. You see, when you say, my Lord and my God, he takes that assertion and keeps it going. Do you realize that your faith, if you're willing to share it, is going to get passed on to somebody and then on to somebody else, and we're going to be taking the Holy Spirit within us, the Christianity that we embrace, and we'll be sending it down through the next millennia. This is what happens when Jesus is your Lord and your God. You know, I was wondering, when Thomas saw the scars on Jesus' hands, that's when his emotional scars were healed. That's when his faith, spiritual scars, were healed. When he saw how much God loved him, what the Lord was willing to go through for him, what Jesus overcame, death, his scars heal our scars. And those hands, they're extended to you and me right now. You know what's the most powerful verse in the whole passage here? It's when Jesus says, blessed are those who do not see and still believe. And friends, I'm going to suggest you and I, you know, we, maybe we don't get to see him, but actually we do. If you pursue him, wow, you're going to find him in the word. You're going to find him in the fellowship. You're going to find him as you serve. He loves to show up and care about you and bless you. Um, yeah, incredible. You know, my, my tech guy, Carter, he, he's just an amazing man of God. And he was telling me that, you know, he got stuck in a situation where, you know, he felt like a demonic was attacking him. 
And as you know how in a dream you can't run, well, he's about to say Jesus is Lord, and he can't say it. And the demon is on him and is choking him. So he goes, oh, I can't say it, but I can pray it. And as he prayed it, the demon was gone. Do you see what's available to you? We can experience Jesus. And friends, not only do we experience Jesus, but we're supposed to help others experience Jesus. You know, this one man was saying that when he was in college, he thought there might be a God, but he also believed in astrology. He also believed in reincarnation. And, and so he comes across Christians uh, on the campus, and you know, they want to tell him all about Jesus, the Lord and Savior, who rose from the dead. And he goes, well, why does God allow war? Well, why is there evil in the world? And he would ans- ask all these difficult questions that you know, young Christians would struggle to answer. And he'd, he'd you know, try to make fun of them and demean them. And, 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 and the Christians, whatever, hey, do you want to come over to our uh, dorm room, our apartment, and and have coffee? You want to have lunch with us? Hey, you want to go hang out later and go to the movies? And and this guy that was basically a stranger, kind of a, you know, a contrary personality, uh, they invited him into their lives. And and they put up with his weird quirks. And they put up with his anti-Christian attitude. And they just showed him love and cared about him. And, And they showed him something that he'd never seen before unconditional love. And he says, after six months, I decided I'm giving my life to Jesus. And this is what he said. I never had a problem believing in the resurrection again because I saw in Christ's body the scars of his people. I saw in Christ's body who people who claimed his name and walked in his life, and did the best they could to follow him. I saw Jesus. And and friends, usually we can't argue somebody into the faith. Now, what they really need is a personal encounter. And when they see Jesus in you, and, and when they let the love of Jesus that you have, when you let the love of Jesus out upon them, that's when they see his, his reality, that's when they step into the relationship. I mean, yeah, we have to answer some questions, but most importantly, it's the demonstration of grace and love and acceptance. And, and so this morning, I, I just want to invite you into this, this place where you are demanding his presence. Where you when you hit that awkward spot in your journey, you decide, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to investigate what's going on. I'm going to pursue the Lord. Because while I might not have an answer, I know that there is one. And Heavenly Father, right now, I want you to move into every household because all of us are struggling. We got issues, problems, dilemmas. We got faith questions that we don't have answered yet. We have doubts about our future. We got questions about our relationship with you. But we're going to stay in this relationship. And as we pray, Lord, show up. And as you show up, take us on that journey. Because I know that as we walk with you, we're going to find you and we're going to just see how great thou art. And friends, this leads us to the communion table. You know, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he basically was telling the disciples, listen, this is my body that's been broken for you. I'm going to go to the cross and give my life for you. I'm going to shed my blood for you. And through that act, you will be forever united with the Father. And this is what Jesus has going on here. He came to remove the sin that separates us from God and and replace that separation with the presence of God so that all times you live in relationship and communion and fellowship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and, you know, I I had a conversation with a, a bright young man this past week. You know, is the bread really the body of Jesus? 
And here's the deal. Well, if you believe Jesus does the miraculous, if you believe Jesus can remove the sin from you and put heaven inside of you, if you believe Jesus answers prayers, if you're willing to take Jesus at his word, well, it doesn't have to be symbolic. Because what you're doing is you're taking Jesus and bringing him into you, which means you're bringing in his promises. You're affirming what he did for you on the cross. You are accepting the fact that he's alive inside of you and he's gonna carry out his agenda of grace and love and compassion and mercy. And so today, as you get your communion set already, I, I want you to understand that, you know, this is not the memorial service that, of what Jesus did. And it's more than just a symbol. Because it's the living word and the living Lord, which means he's alive to do something fresh in your life, alive to answer your prayers. Alive because he loves you. Well, on the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread and first he blessed it and then he broke it saying, this is my body, which has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner also, we took the cup. And as he poured it, he said, this cup is the covenant of my blood shed for the remission of your sins. Drink ye of it and be thankful. Let's take communion together right now. How powerful to bring Jesus all the way in. And I pray right now that the living Lord of the resurrection that puts up with our doubts, that brings us out of hopelessness, the one who reveals himself to us when we seek him, that he would move into your life Answer your prayers. Bring about his presence, his love, his spirit. And take you on a forever journey. It starts now. It never ends. And while we're going, Lord, would you show us the people you want us to take with you, to you, with us, to you? Lord, cause us to talk about you and share you whether it's people in hotels that are shut down or family members and, and neighbors, let our faith show the rest of the people we know that you're alive. In the name of Jesus Christ, I bless you. Amen. In today's fast-moving world, smartphones are integrated into our lives. We bank and shop on our smartphones, and many of us want to give with them too. Giving to the church with a text message is fast, easy, and versatile. With Give Plus Text, you can make a weekly offering or respond to a special appeal in just seconds. To give, you enter the church's 10-digit Give Plus Text number and the amount you wish to donate. Then send your text. The first time you contribute with Give Plus Text, you'll receive a secure registration link. Click the link to go to our secure website where you'll enter your contact and payment information. Tap process when you're done. 
After you've completed your registration, a text reply will verify that your gift has been received. We'll also email you a receipt. For future giving, you simply send a text with the amount you wish to give, and it will process automatically. You can also choose to make your gift recurring. Gift Plus Text is that easy. Register, give, repeat. Call or visit the church office to ask about Give Plus Text and the other electronic giving options we offer.